conversations. And these core conversations are aimed at uh, raising awareness, understanding, and action for the issues that profoundly impact our community. Um, each core conversation will examine a global goal within our local context, provide space to reflect, challenge our assumptions, and explore potential solutions to today's wicked problems. The title for today's core conversation was inspired by freedom writer and Georgia Congressman John Lewis. Um, his quote that said, if not us, then who? If not now, then when? And through it, we hope you will gain insight into how racism impacts systemic and generational health, social and economic outcomes. And we hope you're inspired by the work of the diverse members of our community to address racial discrimination, to reduce inequalities, which is Sustainable Development Goal or SDG 10, and to promote decent work and economic growth or SDG 8 for people of color. Most importantly, we hope that these core conversations will move you to reflect on your own role in our community and understand why Black Lives Matter and explore what you can do to be the change for racial equity and social justice. Um, I do wanna begin by sharing with you a statement from the Impact Hub Global Network. Um, so as one of the world's largest networks building entrepreneurial communities for impact at scale, the Impact Hub community practices respect and inclusion as we support diverse innovators and entrepreneurs working on solutions to the world's most pressing issues. We trust that our work, which is informed by our 18,000 plus members and the people that they reach in over 50 countries around the world, that our work is actively catalyzing systemic transformation and building to a future that works for all. Black lives are human lives, and we believe that we all have the responsibility to fight for them, to fight against racism, xenophobia, bigotry, and discrimination in any form. We are committed to supporting radical, sustainable solutions to ensure the prosperity of Black lives and to continue to proactively learn and educate ourselves along the way. To everyone around the world engaged in this fight, we stand with you. So thinking about our core values, we in the United States have been reflecting on who are we as Americans? Who do we wanna be? How do we collectively define and address racism? What does systemic and institutionalized racism actually look like? And how does it impact our community? What is our role as impact hubs, as individuals in addressing it? And how can we achieve inclusive and equitable impact at scale? And these are a lot of questions for such a pervasive issue which is why we are so excited that the Impact Hub communities from Baltimore, Boston, and New York are here today with us in Houston to address these issues and provide possibilities for how you and we and all of us can work together towards social and economic justice in America. Um, at 2 p.m. right now, we'll have a conversation with Philip Yates. And at 3 p.m., Michelle will welcome Kelvin Lyons, Carrie Bowie, and Karen Brown Stovall um, in a conversation to learn what, the other, what other Impact Hubs are doing. Um, so to launch right into conversation, Philip, thank you so much for joining us. And would you please tell us who you are and what you do? Hi, good afternoon, Grace. Uh, thank you for the invitation, uh, Impact Hub. Um, obviously, um, as a team member of yours on the board, I love everything that both you and Michelle and, and the rest of the Impact Hub Houston committee, community is doing here locally and then also the M Impact Hub network on a national level. Um, so glad to be here and thank you for the invitation. Now, for those of you who have not met, I see a lot of familiar faces on, on this video conference. Um, it's good to see you guys, but for those who don't know me, my name is Philip Yates and I am a, a founder. Um, I'm an attorney, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a husband, um, I'm a dad. That's probably my most important role in this world. And, um, and then I would say now it's important to say that I'm a black man, Grace. Um, so when you asked me to, to be a part of this discussion, I, one, I was just happy to hear somebody who wasn't African-American having this conversation, All right? It's, we've been having this conversation in, in my household my entire life and, and in my community uh, for 400 plus years. Um, but to have somebody reach out that, have, that doesn't share that unique cultural experience uh, means a lot to me. Um, case, and, and, and so I'll start there, being a black man, um, Doing, doing great on one end, right? You know, when, it's, when everything hit and you gave me a call um, and we, we had our conversation, you, myself, and Michelle, um, there's a lot of pride now in being black. And so I, now I can officially say, okay, I'm a black man, and it's okay. And, and I know that that may strike people as odd, um, especially if you haven't had that experience, but I'll tell you for the past 38 years, 
you know, and I'll, I'll explain more in our conversation. You've always had, you, you, everybody knew you were black and it was okay to say, you know, black power, black pride. Um, but when you went into different settings or different rooms or different courtrooms, different boardrooms or different, when you're in different relationships, you had to wear a different face because you felt like you were um, not as valued. Um, so today, because I see the response of America, I see the response of the community, I see the response of my friends like yourself, I can probably say I'm a black man and, and I'll be able to wear that going forward. Um, and, and so, yeah, that, that's where I'm at right now. Just just a lot of mixed emotions, but to have, to, to see where I'm at today at the age of 38, I have to imagine what does my dad feel? Um, my dad was the first, I'll say, I'll, I'm, I, and I like to call myself a first generation American because I was the first black you know, generation to be born with civil rights. My dad wasn't born into a world of civil rights. So if this is my first time feeling whole as a black man because of the response of America and what's going on in this movement, this Black Lives Matters movement, I can only imagine what he's felt. And then let's go back. Let's talk about his dad and his dad and all the way back to that the person who was a, a slave and then those who were taken from their land who I can't even connect with because of everything that's happened over the past 20 years. And so that's where I'll, I'll leave it. I'm just, I'm proud to be a black man. Thank you for sharing that. That is, it's really powerful. It made me think about code switching, right? And you're talking about wearing the mask, right? The, who you are, you have to leave part of who you are at the door when you enter a room. And I think it is, it's really insightful to, to hear from you how, um, how that impacts you as an individual, right? And how does that impact the work that you do? Yeah, that's, um, so as you know, I mean, I, I, I've, I've been on this journey in terms of economic equality, economic justice, um, and, and solving some of the issues that we have with social injustice for quite some time. And so my work in this space um, with entrepreneurship, let's start there, and that's where we met. You, you talk about the code, right? And then so there's the black code that, that had its own concept in the um, Jim Crow era. And then you fast forward through all the issues that we've had to overcome through like the New Deal legislation, um, to the, the, the Great Recession, all the way until now, until you talk about COVID-19, there's been something called the black tax. And I don't know who came up with it, but I read it about a year and a half ago, Grace. And they were talking about those who who, who made strides you know, as an entrepreneur, those who made investments to try to build wealth, there are, every time a traumatic event hits in the black community, it's a reset button. You pay that tax for being that person. And so I'll even say, like, I look up to my, my, my parents and specifically I'll name my dad as a black man. He, he was always there to be a safety net for me, my, my siblings, and a lot of people in my family and community, but he's being tapped. And so now that he's in soft retirement, I say, Who's going to take care of him? And it shouldn't have been that way. He should have been well taken care of based on the labor that he, he, he committed into building up his community, taking care of his family. But because of the density and the distressed assets in our community, we're getting hit with that tax every time there's a traumatic event. And so that's what you're seeing right now. Um, you're, you're, you're seeing a, a depleted or the, a, a community of the, the distressed assets. And they're trying to figure out how do I now become valuable in the community? Um, and so that's what I see in entrepreneurship. In law, now I feel like we're, 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 a lot of us are energized because we, we are one of the few professions that if, you know, once you get our gold card that I carry around with me everywhere, no matter what goes wrong, we have a responsibility. I don't care how you feel. I don't care if you're on the left side of the aisle or the right side of the aisle. If you have that bar card that I'm referring to as a gold card, you have a responsibility to uphold the Texas Constitution and the United States Constitution of America. And that's what we all swore to. And so I'm empowered every single day to fight that fight, whether I'm in the courtroom, uh, whether I'm in the boardroom, or whether I'm in the community with my, my sleeves rolled up um, combating. Um, and, and so that's what I'm seeing at work. I'm seeing the injustices, but you know, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what's that way. What, what, what can I do to bring my solutions to the table so that I can work with people like you, you and Impact Hub and others on this call so that we can convene resources and, and share them you come up with shared answers. And I think that's what you're seeing right now in the community. We're recognizing that there is a problem. Um, it's like, how do you solve it? Um, I had a friend of mine who's a colleague. He's a very established uh, attorney here in Houston. And he said, Philip, can we do lunch? He said, um, you know, we've had our conversations and I always thought that if I just went to, um, if I donated money or time and resources to young people 
in, uh, in education. I, that would solve the problem. You know, little black kids, if they got a good education, got exposure to quality of life, we're done. And that's the answer. And I was like, he said, now I'm figuring out there's layers to this issue. And that's the point. I think everybody thought, when you think about racism, or you think about the institution of racism, you always thought there was one thing. So when people said police brutality, you were like, well, maybe it's because they didn't know the law. And then you start seeing these recordings where you have citizens obeying the law, but still being subjected, ridiculed, and then almost being forced into these situations where now um, there's excessive force and sometimes lead to police killings. Um, but that's the same in education. You know, we, we got our education, our, our rights to um, equal education, our civil rights in, in the 60s. But we do know, just based on everything that happened um, with our economy, that if, if you're, you're put into an an equitable situation, you're going to have a lesser value education, and so you don't get to you don't get to advance. Healthcare, but I didn't even know this, but you know, like did black women for some reason that I can't explain because that's not my field, that they're subject to risk where they may die during labor. In fact, my wife, she we literally our first child went through an experience where she almost died um, just based off of. Whether doctors were wrong or right, I don't know. But then the more I study and I heard about it, it's like it's only common to black women. It's like why, you know? And then so that's healthcare. Um, also, we know about the jobs or the workforce in terms of if you don't if you don't have access to the proper network, how are you going to get a job, especially in a shrinking workforce where it's now the gig economy. Um, so I, and then if you can't get it, you know, so I, I go on and on that we're recognizing these problems and obstacles. But now the steps are what are we going to do about it? I mean, we know the, the impact that racism has had and is still having from 400 years ago. But what are we going to do? Well, thank you for saying that we, first of all, for sharing all of your experiences. Um, but thank you for sharing about the, um, we know that racism has, has an impact. I think a lot of people don't know that racism has had an impact. You know, and you talk about a lot of these systemic and generational issues and, um, you know, I make it a point to look at what um, conservatives are saying or people who talk about all lives matter, you know, or blue lives matter and um, see what their perspective is to, to better understand, you know, why is there opposition to supporting black lives? Um, so I, I'd love for you to, uh, to unpack a little bit. What does that generational um, and systemic racism look like? What are these layers that you're talking about? Um, because, you know, I think people don't understand that tax, right? The tax on you as a black man for people to reach out to you and say, teach us, you know, because you, you have to teach them, right? So there are people who don't know. Um, and the, the great ones are proactive about trying to learn more. But for the ones who aren't proactive, who just say, well, if they just worked harder, right? Or if they acted right, then this wouldn't happen to them. Do you know what I mean? Can you, yeah, please unpack that for us. Yeah, I, I think... And so for me, I, I, I've lived an interesting life in this black skin my whole life. Um, I've been fortunate to, 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 to experience two worlds. I mean, one growing up in southwest part of uh, Houston, A-Leaf, um, you, you have some, some great areas in that community and some blighted um, areas in that community are, are, are distressed communities, are underserved parts of it. And so people, we, we didn't have, I saw... I guess I, I saw two sides of the way I could go uh, in my lifetime. And growing up, there's a problem with access um, in my generation. I think the new generation uh, of leaders will have something else that they're exposed to. But for us, based on, you know, we talk about the New Deal and the, the, those de facto discriminatory laws that were passed after the civil rights era during that time, you had a certain group of people that came into um, the, the workforce economy, this new um, desegregated economy where they had just the education, and that's all you really had. And so Philip's born into this world. He sees, you know, black mom, black dad. Dad has a job, but that's it. He has a job. He doesn't really have a profession yet. He has to work into a profession that, that he's accepted in. Mom takes care of the family. That's her main job. That's all you know is you take care of your job. The TV shows you two types of people in this time frame. It shows you you know, the, the, the happy, full, the, the family that has the mom, the dad, the, the dog, uh, the son, the daughter, this big house, the white picket fence, and they're all white. They're all blonde hair, blue eyes. Everybody who's pretty on every commercial is blonde hair, uh, blue eyes, or they're brunette, and they're, but nobody has dark skin. Nobody looks like you, except when you talk about 
violence, you talk about crime, you talk about drugs, you talk about evil, that's when you get the black face. And so you grow up understanding, okay, what do you have access to and what is it you're supposed to become um, when you grow up? We have now, there is a good side about being black. You can be a hip hop artist, so you get access to rap, you get access to basketball, and then you get access to crime. You're talking about, I'm going to get to All Lives Matter, but first you have to understand the plight of the storyline of the black man and black woman, and, and then why they get to this point when you say, if they just do right. And so if all you've been exposed to, and this is Philip, I had the drug dealers. In fact, my older brothers were the biggest drug dealers at that time. Um, I have friends still locked up because of the crimes they had to commit because that's all they felt like they had options to. I chose basketball. My brother chose rap. Basketball got me to a point where I didn't go down that lane. I still made mistakes, and that's because I'm just human. But in terms of the pathway I picked, it was because of sports. And then I had a family. Everybody doesn't have a family because if you go back to those laws that were passed, if you go back to the limited opportunities based on the zip code you're born into, the family you're born into, and, the, and potentially the color of your skin because of the opportunities you're exposed to, you're very limited. And so now you didn't pick the pathway to eventually I got derailed because I got introduced to my stepmother who's my third parent. We're now introduced to law. And that's how you get Philip Gates. You get people, you get parents that had a legacy of giving back. You had a mom that she wouldn't let this, she wasn't gonna let anything happen to her cubs, to her kids. She was gonna make sure PJ was all right. And you had a dad that was a, a business person and a community developer. And so that's how you get me. But I'm one decision away from being that drug dealer. I'm one decision away from being that person locked up until he's 55 for armed robbery. I'm one decision away from being that person that we had to bury. I'm one decision away from not being Philip Gates and, you know, talking to my good friend, Grace Rodriguez, about, uh, about, about um, issues that matter to me and my community and then having a role and, and bringing a solution. So we talk about our, all lives matter. There's nobody else in the history of mankind that can, that can that's had to be subjected despite what the law say, despite the issues that have been identified, they still are, are subject to these same societal pressures. So yes, all lives do matter, but until you recognize that this is what's going on in real time, I'm not even talking about you know, 1691. I'm not talking about 246 years after that and the fact that you, know, you, you say that we've been free that long and we still have only achieved 1% of wealth in, in, in this economy, and this is 400 years later. We're giving you real reasons. And then it took a group of young people to use technology and to say, you know what, to heck with it. We're going to do it our way. And then finally, five years after they were established, they showed you enough videos. It took an unarmed man. It took um, no guns to be involved. It took eight minutes and 46 seconds of all of our time for us to finally realize there's a problem with racism. And we're talking about all lives matter. It, it, it's just not a common sense argument. Now, as a Christian, as a man of faith, and, and a man who's, who's represented a lot of walks, and I, 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 about, I protested for other people that had nothing to do with me. This is the first time, like I told you, I felt proud to be black. And all I'm asking is for everybody who has that, that same um, mindset or faith or value, value comp that value proposition or moral compass to walk with us. That's all we're asking. We're not saying to, to stop saying that all lives matter, because they do. But until black people stop being murdered, until every time we come up with a negative statistic, whether it's with education, health, wealth disparity, business, um, anything that's not hip hop or rap, you know, hip hop or crime related, until it's not something positive, that says black people are now equal, or there's a reason outside that you can compare me not by my color, my skin, you just say, you know what, if you're born in this zip code, you're gonna be poor. But no, there's, we can actually go to every standard and it talks about economic development and uh, wealth and blacks are in the last place. And this is, this is 400 years in the making. Um, so I say that to, all, to everybody, yes, all lives do matter. That's, kind of, that's the reason why we're here. We're, all we're asking is to make it so that we no longer have to have a conversation about only blacks being killed. Nobody should be killed. So it is a, a social justice, right? And, and I don't, and I don't, anybody who has that argument, as a, somebody who does his best to stay current, I know there's only 40 million African-Americans in, in the United States. 
Now, I know not all of us are in poverty. Not all of us are going walking the same walk in life. And I know there's 28 million white people that are living in poverty right now. So the question about equality is, is, is for all of us. And so, yes, I do want to continue to promote that. And that's what equal liberty is about, making sure there's equal, equal access to everybody. But right now, we have to redirect our resources to the African-American community and finally solve this problem. I appreciate right. that. Well, what I've been saying to people who now say all lives matter is they do. And that is why you should show up for black lives just as much as you, you show up for other lives, right? So um, it, it reminds me of, um, I don't know if you saw the video of um, Kimberly Jones, where she talks about at the very end, she ends with, you know, you're lucky that all black people want is equality and not revenge. You know, and she talks about how um, we don't own anything. She's an African-American woman. And she's talking about how we don't own anything because there has been systemic and generational racism. So, you know, it, it reminded me of, I'd gone to a gala for a national nonprofit organization and the people who were being awarded um, were talking about how they you know, were fourth or fifth generations of supporting that organization. And it, the first thing I thought about was because you had the privilege to, right? Like we, a lot of people of color, or most people of color did not have the opportunity to participate in any kinds of organizations several or several uh, couple generations ago, as you were saying with your father and your grandfather. Um, so I'm wondering, um, what, how do you change this? How do you address this in, in a way that helps change the system? You know, how do you disrupt generational poverty or generational disparity and turn that into generational inclusion and equity? So you mentioned equ equilibrity, and I know that you're also a co-founder for the Diversity Fund. Can you talk about what you're doing through those to help um, right those wrongs? Yeah, no, absolutely, Grace. Um, no. As you know, I've been trying to monitor this problem for a very long time. And, and I was on a call yesterday with the um, By Black group. And so John Hope Bryan, who's been doing an excellent job in this space for decades now, he, he stated that over 50% of the African, African Americans in this country have a credit score below, I wrote it down, um, 620. And so if you think about that, that's not all poor people. Um, so that means there's an access problem here. So that means no, no matter how hard you work, how many degrees you have, um, how, um, how great of a job you did, of not, being inter not interacting with the laws or breaking any laws, um, no matter how much you say, you still are handicapped in your ability to create wealth and pass it on to the next generation. Now, for the year 2020, they're predicting that over $750 billion are going to start passing hands. And none of that all belongs to blacks. And so what I'm trying to do at this for a small percentage of that is we create two, two approaches. Uh, really, it's a credit or grave approach that I've been working on. One, I'll say Diversity Fund Houston, uh, which I can't take all credit for because I've had the pleasure of working with uh, my co-founder, Tiffany Williams, and then also Kylie Summers. And also, I'll tell you, Grace, and I want to make sure everybody knows that you were a big inspiration on how um, Diversity Fund Houston started. When the technology... Um, an innovation hub for the city of Houston first um, came on, came online, which was years, a couple of years ago when you found a station in Houston. I, I started recognizing that a lot of the businesses that I've been fortunate enough to grow along at the Houston Area Urban League at their entrepreneurship center were now interested in tech businesses, but didn't feel like they were welcome or included. And then they, as they and as they went through these challenges, they also um, started identifying issues with getting access to certain rooms or getting the response they needed in terms of whether it's the product development or access to capital. For you, Grace, you let us in. You met with us. You gave us, you introduced us to people in your, in your address book. Um, you, you, you helped us build relationships. And fast forwarding two years, three years later, now you're still, you're still serving on our board at Diversity Fund Houston, which is designed for those of you who aren't familiar with it, um, to help out with the friends and family round um, for those who are African American or Hispanic or Latinx, and they're trying to build technology and high growth companies. Um, what we identified just before talking about is, if you look at the credit piece, and we talk uh, that we're having that issue, and then you also go back to the conversation Grace and I had regarding the black tax, well, that's your friends and family round. Um, so, and then you throw in COVID-19 or any traumatic event um, that you can think of that may happen, you, you think about how 
our, if there's a distressed asset, whether that's our, you know, and which is our, we, we have enough data to show that our, that's what our community is, we don't have friends and family that can write a check. Um, with, and even if it's to a vehicle that's merit, you know, worthy of that investment, just like there's counterparts from another race that can potentially uh, achieve goals that can create wealth uh, in, our, in our communities. And so we want to be that friends and family around. And we started that right now and, uh, with your help. We are now in, a, in the process of securing $3 million in our first fund, which is the GRID fund. Um, so that's, that's one of the first solutions where we'll start looking at businesses um, being created in our ecosystem of people who look like you and I. Um, people look like everybody that I can see on this call. And, and those people just looking for an opportunity. So we're going to build diversity through people's capitalization tables. So through our investments, as long as you have a diverse founder or you meet that, um, that threshold and, and that we set at our board meeting, we'll talk more about that another time, then yeah, we can start making a change through endow investments. And not only that, we're going to use the Diversity Fund Houston platform to convene other resources. Um, I don't think, uh, I don't want, I don't ever, I've never thought to myself that money's the problem to everything because capital is only one thing, it only one, or my money capital. I think you also need human capital. And so we want to convene the resources so that those founders that may come through the Urban League um, or other similar situated organizations, they now can get connected to Impact Hub. They can get connected to the CAN. They can get connected to the ION and all the other sub, um, subsets in our ecosystem so that now they have capital and they have access to grow in the same manner as, as businesses that look like them. So that's one. Um, and then on the other side, uh, which has been my baby for years, um, equal liberty. Um, this is actually a concept that came to me roughly about 12 years ago. I was talking with my cousin, and he introduced me to an economist slash lawyer by the name of Louis Kelso. He actually started the employee share, well, he helped um, put the legislation behind the employee um, share ownership plans for, you know, company corporations so that employees will feel more, have more value, feel more, uh, they have more ownership in, in these corporations, and which did well. And so he, he obviously he used the, that concept was spun off of something called binary economics. And after studying that for some time, I, I, I looked at it as a model that could be done inside our community. Binary economics is basically a way to level out um, production and consumption. And so if you, if you look at the black community, we know that we have, we have, dollars, we have dollars coming passing through. It's not circulating. I believe it's like you know some seconds or hours in terms of how quickly the dollar leaves the black community. Um, so, but we also have a 1.2 trillion dollar spending power um, in the black community. So we have money. Um, so, but that's consumption. We also know that black people aren't afraid to work. So back to the people who think we're lazy. No, black people will hustle their butt off. I got friends that have uh, about five multi-level marketing businesses. They have their own. They'll cut hair out of the yard. They'll even sell drugs at one time. And then they'll cook. They will do anything to work. I mean, I've never met, a la I don't have very many lazy black friends in our family. Now, is it productive? No. <laughs> All right. I will be the first one to say that we haven't been as productive or maybe we wouldn't be in this, this situation today. And so what Equal Liberty is doing is looking at the fact that we do have assets in our community. We do have creators that will create something beautiful um, out of nothing, out of a problem, out of inspiration, out of just a sheer desire to feel empowered that I am a creator. In fact, if you, I know you've helped out plenty of our, our founders and creators in our community, Grace, and a lot of times you'll see them hashtag away. I'm, I'm guilty of the hashtag. <laughs> um, and, and, I mean, they're, they're empowered. I mean, there's something about being an owner and a creator, but we need to do is making sure, make sure that we use those distressed assets and add value to them. Um, I'll get back to Equilibrium, but I want to, because what's, what's been happening so far, and, I, and I'll talk about creator, the creative, being creative is something that I think we all can identify in the black community. If you look at the hip hop industry, which we created in the late 70s, early 80s, that was something just like the conversation I was telling you, I mean, the, the topic I was talking about with our black skin not being proud. We owned hip hop, but when we left our homes and our communities, we were afraid to embrace it. In fact, we were taught by the, the, the people who, who um, the, the gatekeepers of the establishment that if you looked or had the image of hip hop tattoos, the graffiti, the, the way we wear our shoes, the way we dress, there's no way you can get a job. You know, you don't look the part. 
But now look what's going on. Well, first, there's like $70 billion in hip hop industry being appropriated by people who don't look like us. You look at the CEOs and the founders, those people then wouldn't capitalize off the same um, creation and made money off of it. You, know, you had your Jay Z's, LeBron James, but those are one offs. We're talking about all the countless of people who, who didn't get to choose basketball or get introduced to a Judge Ye that made the decision. Um, and they actually had to go down the, the lane of crime or whatever, I have or have you, and they never got a chance to own anything and be a creator. We want to go to all those people who were dreamers and creators and show them, you know, you might have lost hip hop to America, but there's other things you're creating in your backyard or in your homes or in your communities, at your churches, um, with your friends. And we can now help you build sustainable businesses so that we don't have to continue to have the black tax and have to continue to hit the reset button. And we're going to do that through shared ownership. Uh, going back to that great call with, with John Hope Bryan, he talked about one aspect. I was able to talk about law, but somebody was able to talk about finance and so on and so forth. But what if we did that every day in our community? What if every time uh, somebody decided they want to create something special, there was a space for them to go to with other people who've created something special and then to share in that. And then they can say, okay, this is the answer we think works. That hasn't always been the case in our community where we've been able to co-create. In fact, we've been put inside this box from the very beginning. Um, I've studied in our, our group at the Urban League to a point where I don't even think a curriculum is necessary anymore. Necessary because I don't think it's productive for us. So going back to Lewis Kelso, in terms of making sure that you not necessarily decrease consumption, but increase productivity, but is productiveness. And that's what this technology platform is supposed to do. Find out what's going to be productive. Just be, if you if you don't make a certain amount of money, having a savings account is not going to help you achieve wealth. If you can only put five cents away, you're going to die with five dollars like the, the, the national average of black women in America. But if you're working as a chef and you only have five dollars to put away, but somebody teaches you how to own your own chef business while maintaining your employment, maybe as an independent contractor because of the gig economy, and somebody gives you all the tools so that you can build a sustainable business, so that you can create jobs, pay your taxes, be able to qualify for the PPP, be able to then now take some of their uh, retained earnings and put into a savings account. Now you're talking about how you're solving the problem. Um, and that's what Equilibrium is going to do in terms of taking all the different neighbors and employees that Lewis Kelso talked about in his binary economics and give them, them the tools so that they now can create wealth as a community. And that's without taking anybody's property away from them. And I think that's the most important part. I'm not a legislator, so I'm not here to talk about who to tax, but I do believe that we can all, if we all came together, we can solve the problem together without taking somebody's property and equilibrium, that's what it's gonna do. Yeah, I think that's critical. You're talking about um, building wealth as a community. Um, there's a, you know, there's so much research about how powerful black buying dollars are. And so if people start considering how do we reinvest in our communities and start working towards ownership of, of assets and, and not depreciating assets, right? But true mm -hmm. assets that build generational wealth. Um, this is where structures like Equilibrity, the Diversity Fund, and um, some of the other um, organizations that will be presented at 3 p.m. can help help drive more equity um, and more equitable solutions for different communities. Um, it's really interesting that you talk about hustling, right? You know, a lot of people talk about side hustles, like it's this big trend. But right. I know in communities of color, we've always had at least, it feels like three to five, yeah, <laughs> three to five different jobs. Um, yeah. And it reminds me of, I don't know if you remember In Living Color or if you're too young for that. <laughs> I'm fine with being as old as I am. Um, where they, they, you know, there's the Jamaicans. That was a sketch where if you had less than seven jobs, you're just Wait, wait, yeah. am I old, I'm old now? Wait, what happened? <laughs> I was the young guy in the room, not anymore. <laughs> um, but I wonder if there's, there are other things that you're seeing. You know, one of the things that, I, that was really powerful to me, I went to SOCAP uh, or Social Capital Markets, this conference that happens in the Bay Area, area every year where impact investors from around the world convene. And they were talking about the rise of opportunity zones, right? And the idea that um, people could now invest in um, opportunity zones, which are uh, economically depressed areas of different places um, to spur innovation within those communities. And what people were finding was it just allowed rich people to go in and buy property from poor people. Um, so there was a lot more, you know, the potential for a rapid uh, displacement and gentrification was happening. And um, there was one group in, the, in uh, Oakland, though, that decided to uh, develop a land trust. 
you know, so mm -hmm. people could pool their money together and then actually purchase these properties. So then again, it was a collective. Um, and I find that that might be the fastest way to getting to equity is how do we work together as a collective? So I'm wondering, is there, is there anything else that you're seeing within um, the black communities in Houston or nationwide that is, is moving towards more ownership of, of real, you know, um, appreciating assets? Yeah, no, um, a lamp, no, to your, I was actually being courted by an investor recently and he brought up land trust and, and that's something that he would be interested in seeing equal liberty during the future. Um, when we first started Diversity Fund Houston, um, the opportunity zones were, um, were something that we just kept running into. And everybody's like, you need to do it. And uh, there were some people willing to help, but the problem is you had to actually create the vehicle and then you had to fully understand the laws and we, we just didn't have enough time to do that and uh, in diversity for Houston. But I know some people are still moving forward, but I believe like that window, the, the window closed in terms of when you get the full benefits of what those uh, opportunity funds and zones are supposed to do. Um, also crowdfunding is becoming major in, in our community. Um, there's a, a guy by the name of Chris Senegal who I've been on a few panels with, who he just had an article in the Chronicle Grace and, and talked about how he went into third ward and he, he's been able to buy the block, and he's known as the buy the block guy. And, but he's basically using the, the crowdfunding method to aggregate resources and, and invest in distressed properties, which is an opportunity for what is worth for anybody on this, this call who listens to it later. When you're going, we're going through COVID-19, that's one way you can make sure that um, there's decreased wealth in the black community or, or other communities of color is by looking at these distressed assets and figuring out how can we use a land trust or a crowdfunding type vehicle purchase the property, but then making sure it stays within there, maybe resell it back to the family who didn't have the income at the time. I've read some articles on that. I don't have the name of the organization, but these are some of the solutions that they're coming up with. They're being, people are being pretty creative. Um, you're seeing this, this turn of the tide, Grace, where everybody, not only are they identifying like, things like racism being a problem, but they're also looking at special interests. People are starting to put their own needs to the side and say there's value and you've been saying this since the beginning. Uh, I would say you, between you and Aaron McClarity, y'all y'all beat it with, <laughs> beat that dead horse with a stick and y'all let people know you can, create, you can still make money and have a social impact in society. And I think everybody's starting to look at that in terms of collaborating. And that's the approach I have with Equal Liberty in terms of shared ownership of everything. Um, and that's kind of what I've been able, fortunate to learn through my work at the Urban League. And, and one of the special, unique uh, experience I've had is, really getting people to believe in the virtual cycle. Um, and, and so in terms of as you learn something, you come back and teach it. And that's a way for you not only to build your own credibility, but you can build credibility in that community. And so you're seeing a lot of that right now. Um, also, um, and then of course, the micro venture capital fund that we have, um, we're trying to fill gaps. Uh, there's also Belma who's out there who's trying to fill another gap in the angel, um, angel investment community. Um, so you're seeing a lot of people. I, I like what Impact Hub is doing, um, where we actually uh, create the, the fiscal partnerships with for-profit companies and allowing them to do good by partnership, partnering with Impact Hub, and then that being a way to actually invest in communities while having a maintain a business relationship. Um, so there's just a lot of unique opportunities, and then corporate America is starting to get involved. Uh, past couple of weeks, I saw there's there's been one point Three billion dollars, I believe, committed to the Black Lives Matter movement. And the way they're they're basically quantifying that, I believe, is just going to organizations that are doing the work, like the Impact Hub, like the Missionary Urban Leagues, Baker Ripley's of the world, um, and so on and so forth. And Equal Liberty. Um, I'm hoping because we're an impact vehicle um, that, that's going to help out with the African American community, that we'll be able to gain some partnerships as well. Thank you for that. Um, I want to just uh, add one last thing before we're moving to questions from uh, the audience. Uh, we're also working with NextSeed right now. So NextSeed is a crowdfunding platform, and we were talking with them about launching um, an Impact Hub community on their website so that people can crowdfund for their own businesses, um, again, to provide access to capital for women and minority-owned businesses, impact-focused businesses, um, and in a way that is um, that people can invest and get back money from their investment too, right? So it's not just, it's not crowdfunding in the sense of I'll donate you some money like GoFundMe and never see anything in return. I'll actually be able to put money into Equilibrity and then, you know, get like 
a one point whatever X um, in revenue share on my return or however you decide to structure it because um, they are uh, registered with SEC as a broker dealer. So, um, so with that, you know, people, everybody, please stay tuned. We'll keep everyone updated on that. Um, but in the meantime, here's a question from Christina Wright, and she asks if you can speak to any realizations that you've had about yourself, your community, or the system over the past few weeks. And um, before I, I hope everybody heard that she said that Equal Liberty is going to be the first one to raise money. <laughs> on their, no, I'm joking, but to that question, the realization was I felt like I wasn't doing enough. Um, you know, you look, I was, I was one of those people every, every time I heard this conversation, I always said, I'm doing my part. You know, I'm in the community, I'm in the courtroom, I'm in the boardroom, I, I go down to the Capitol, I'll do everything I can to make this, this fight mine. And, but when you see somebody lying on the ground with five officers with a knee to his neck, cry out to his mom, for eight minutes and 46 seconds. You felt hopeless at one point, but you also felt like you weren't doing enough. Um, and so that that was my realization that I have more work to do as a black man, especially as a black man that's never been afraid to go into another community, whether it be a traditional, uh, predominantly white community, a predominantly Hispanic community, the LGBT community, the people who are living in below poverty, the top 1% of, of, of uh, the people who are in jail, the, the gangbangers, the rappers, the ball, everything. I, I've had that, all those experiences. And I think people who have no problem listening, no problem learning, now I have to have more courage to advocate. And, I, and I, I, I've never been voiceless, but I don't feel like I've been using my voice enough. And so I'm not saying that I have the answers, but I think the more opportunity we have to speak on how we feel, especially with those who have mutual respect and trust for, with each other, then we'll solve a problem. Um, you know, just a couple weekends ago, and I posted on my LinkedIn, you know, I was playing in the backyard with my kids and my wife, and um, the neighbor hopped on the fence, and he just looked over, and he started some, you know, small talk, and then he said, I'm with you. And, and then he, he went forward to say, you know, I, 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 never, I never had this conversation with anybody, and, I, and, and sometimes I ignored it when my friends were talking about it. But for the first time, I know it's, it's my responsibility to not only correct my friends, but I need to let you know I'm with you and that I'm also going to have this conversation with my kids. And I think that's the realization that there's good people in this world. Everybody truly wants to believe all lives matter. Everybody truly wants to make sure we have this utopian society where everybody's okay. But the reality is we're not. The reality is that although, you know, half the people who scream Black Lives Matter, they're also driving down Main Street under 45 and they pass right by people who look just like them. And that's after church. That's the reality that people are hurting. There's, there's reality that people who can't get a job because they're not legal. But they still have children they have to take care of. So now they're in hiding, but now they have to figure out a way to provide for their kids. I'm Black and I don't have that issue. And so I still have to recognize that there's other people who are still going through this, this inequality. I have to recognize that the Senate majority leader, majority leader sits in a county in, in Kentucky that is predominantly white, but is the poorest county in our nation. They're all white, they look in, but they have similar struggles. And so we all have this unique, we all have to have a unique sense of empathy and passion, I believe. And I think for me, it's more or less having that realization that I need to be more vocal about all that. And so that's been my, my experience uh, as a black man uh, really over the past couple of weeks, just going through those thoughts and having exercises and having these conversations. I love the fact we have a lot of other people having this discussion. And I'm hoping that we all can just come to a realization was, are you doing enough? Because obviously I can point to the data to show America's not doing enough. So we all have to do our part. Yeah. And who can we invite to do more with us? Right. Absolutely. Um, so uh, we have another question from Angela Randolph. Do you think the global awareness of what it means to be black in America is a trend that will dissipate over time and will be back to status quo? Or do you think real change in policies and practice and more importantly, the hearts and minds of people will happen? Good question. Um, both good questions, but I like that one. Um, you know, in the past, I've always said to myself, ah, you know, this, this is just a passing. This is, this is going to pass by and it's going to go back to business as, as usual for America. In fact, when a mod was murdered. I thought that to myself. In fact, I was almost become, I was getting disgusted 
with so many people jumping on this bandwagon as if this is something new. But when George Floyd was murdered, and he was murdered in front of all of us by those officers, and they showed no remorse, no, there was no feeling in their body. It was like it was okay that this guy is going through this struggle and about to die. I think it, it, it sent a, a heartbeat to everybody. Now I don't think there's any, not only they sent a heartbeat, but we were forced to watch it because of COVID-19. And I, I gotta add that part. If we were not going through a pandemic, I think everybody would have been caught up in their, you know, whatever consumes them on a daily basis. But this, you had to be consumed by this. And so now they, you no longer can ignore this. And as I said at the beginning of this call, I'm proud to be a black man. I'm not gonna always have to change my voice or I'm not gonna always sit up like this. Now, I, you know, Grace, I one time had a judge, in, a chief judge in the bankruptcy court who we was going through some case and he, he just stopped me. And he's a Caucasian male, great guy. In fact, he teaches all the young bankruptcy lawyers at the time, you know, just how to, their way around the courts. And he said, Philip, you talk like that? And I was like, hey, my name is Philip and I'm raising a case. <laughs> and I was doing like, <laughs> I have my interview voice on. And, and I didn't get the case wrong, but he just stopped me and he said, do you really talk like that? And then and it's one of the lawyers in there in the courtroom said, no, he doesn't talk like that. And he said, use your normal voice. He said, and then I talked and I spoke with and I did this with my holding over and my, my, my closing of the case. He said, talk like that because I trust you now. Like, that's who you are. Um, and, and I think that's what everybody has to do. You have to give everybody the opportunity to be okay. And I think that's what they're gonna, we're gonna do going forward because now you've been, Angela, I mean, I think everybody has, everybody's here with this reality. And like I told you about my friend who texted me, you know, just last night, he wants to have lunch. Everybody needs to continue to have this conversation and do their part. Thank you. I, I wanna share, um, you know, from my perspective, the answers to a couple of those questions. Um, reflecting on my experience as an Asian American, you know, we were also, when COVID hit, we were, our community was experienced a lot of racism and violence. There were, there was a family, including a two-year-old and a six-year-old that were stabbed in Midland because some guy thought that was saying that, you know, Chinese were responsible for bringing it over, even though the family that he's, that he stabbed wasn't Chinese, you know, so there's just, there, you know, thinking about systemic racism, I really started exploring what does it mean to be Filipina American in this country? Because Filipinos also have a very different experience than East Asian Americans and the Chinese and the Japanese. You know, we came over as farm workers. And I look back even farther, who are the first Filipinos in the country? And it, it, it taught me that the first um, black slaves in America didn't come in 1619. They actually came in the 1500s, um, the same as Filipino slaves, because from the Spanish. You know, so the, the first slaves on, in, Ameri in the Americas were actually brought by the, the Spanish. So it, it made, just made me think about what are other commonalities that we don't know because we didn't have the right. pens when we wrote the history books or when the history books were written, right? And how much history has been erased and how much of common culture and shared um, struggle has been erased because there's an approach of divide and conquer, right? If we make, it, and it, I was looking back at that too, that was like um, from the art of war and um, this uh, you know, go, goes back really far in terms of if people, can, if people in power or people who want power can get other people who collectively have more power to fight amongst themselves, then they can win. And so you know, I'm really looking forward to continuing this conversation to see how can we come together so that we all win. Um, there's another question from Megan. Um, and then this will be the last one before we move to, to wrap for the, for the next panel. Um, but do you know if we have lobbying organizations in DC lobbying for changes like, like the groups that argue for maintaining the divisions? Um, she knows that it starts in communities, but we need to legislate and mandate change to make some people who are resistant to change. Yeah, no, um, good question. And to my knowledge, yes. Um, so the Texas, I know we have like Texas civil rights. I know there's a, one, a civil rights group on the federal level. I work closely with the National Urban League which advocates for legislation for equal equality and, and also black African-American rights. Um, you have the NAACP that advocates, you have the, um, the, the, I would say the Black Caucus also, they're actually the legislative body that comes together and they, they actually look at bills or that's, a, that's the first place for us to go as black people who either are in the black community or support the black community um, to go look at, for a partner or somebody to carry the bill in, in DC. Now, are there any corporations that lobby? I don't know if there's any major ones, but I know there's some, some lobbying firms that will partner up with certain nonprofit and um, 
special, in, you know, special interest groups um, to my knowledge. But that's all I have, uh, Grace. Karen shared a link in the chat. <laughs> it's uh, ILSR.org. So I'm assuming that's another organization that's lobbying for it. And, um, and I want to thank you, Philip, so much for joining this. I'm going to just like share one more thing. Um, we decided to launch these core conversations this week in honor of Juneteenth after seeing over and over again how many of our world's most pressing issues disproportionately impact black and brown communities. Um, in Houston, for instance, we actually launched PPE for the people to provide personal protective equipment for um, workers of color um, in the places in Houston, which you know are again like predominantly black and low income communities that are um, being heavily hit by this, um, by this disease and the, the coronavirus. So um, for those who don't know what Juneteenth is, especially if you're not from the US, um, Juneteenth commemorates June 19th, 1865, when Union Gen General Gordon Granger read the federal orders in Galveston, Texas, which is less than an hour from us here in Houston, that all enslaved people in Texas were now free. And while this is important because even though the Emancipation Proclamation was um, formalized and officially freed the slaves almost two and a half years earlier, because Texas was the most most remote of the slave states um, with a low presence of Union troops, the enforcement had been slow and inconsistent. And so we want to make sure that we don't take that long to get you the resources that you need to take action. Um, after the session, you will receive a follow-up email with a lot of the links um, that we referenced, you know, to the organizations and, and efforts that we referenced, including more, um, you know, how to be an anti-racist, how to be a better ally. There's different guides to allyship. Um, and then, <clears throat> excuse me, we also will send you links to Juneteenth talks, workshops, and celebrations that you can participate in online. So there's a lot happening 18, you know, uh, yeah, the, from tomorrow through Sunday um, around Juneteenth to continue this conversation and see how can we move towards a more inclusive and equitable and just society. Um, we also invite you to be a part of the Impact Hub community. So become a member um, and support and donate to the Impact Hubs that are closest to you. Uh, you can always find us through the Global Networks website at impacthub.net. And if you have any other topics that you think that we should address, or if you want to um, share your experiences, please feel free to do so um, on our Facebook page. It's facebook.com slash impact hub Houston, um, or just you know, contact us again through the links that are uh, included on impacthub.net. Um, Karen Brown Stovall is, is sharing at Common Future that they imagine a future where people, no matter their race or ethnicity, have power, choice, and ownership over the economy. So I recommend that you also go to their website, commonfuture.co, um, and then, you know, engage, learn more. Um, it's not that hard to research. For some reason, people don't understand that Google is their friend. Um, and for anything that you want to learn, um, whether it's more history, uh, more, more, more information about the Black experience in, in America, um, please, please do so and Google that. And then, Philip, is there anything else you'd like to share before we, before we end to for the for the next panel? Uh, yes, um, everybody who, uh, who participated, and uh, obviously, Grace, I look forward to talking to you about this. We are launching the next iteration of Equal Liberty this fall. So, stay tuned. Um, August, we look to partner with everybody. That's really what this is all about for us, in terms of like you said, um, Grace and. We want to co-create what that next opportunity looks like. I know we talked about going to Washington and uh, lobbying, and we can do the same thing at the state level. But I think this is a moment in time where we all can take individual ownership of this, this problem that we have and come up with collective ideas. Let's imagine together. Let's come together and let's hopefully come up with solutions and share answers together. And we hope you can do that with equal liberty this, this fall. Thank you, Grace. Thank you, Michelle, Impact Hub Houston, and everybody else involved, Impact Hub Network. This has been great, and I, I'm, I'm loving um, the core conversation. I look forward to seeing and participating in the next one. Thank you so much, Philip.